Welcome, and I want to say what a joy it is to be together, worshiping together today, especially on this Mother's Day that we celebrate together. What a joy it is to give thanks to the Lord for uh, the very special, unique, one-of-a-kind love and care He has given to us through our mothers. Perhaps you are able to uh, celebrate in person uh, with your mom today or at least make that contact you may not be able to do that anymore and perhaps even those joyful memories do bring uh, perhaps even tears with them as well but in that case I want you to thank God for the blessing for the legacy uh, that you have been given that was passed on to you and that you have the opportunity to pass on as well we'll be talking a bit more about that as we open God's Word in just a few moments. But I want to say welcome to each and every one of you, especially if you're a guest with us today, perhaps visiting family on this special Mother's Day. And I want to welcome you. We would love uh, to get to know you a little bit better. And one of the easiest ways we can do that beyond the little bit of time that we have together here this morning is for you to fill out uh, one of our Connect cards you can do that uh, by taking one of those cards that's there in the, pool, in, the, in the pew pockets in front of you. Or you can go to our website, uh, ebcinchrist.org slash connect. If you're watching online, that's one of the easiest ways, quickest ways you can do that. You can scan that QR code in your bulletin as well. And we would love to uh, be able to contact you to say thank you in a more personal way for being a part of our worship time together, especially if you're a first-time guest or new to our area. But also, even if you're part of our church family, I would encourage you to use that as well to share an information change, to share a prayer request, or other information that you would like to pass on directly to us. But it's good, so good to be together today. I want to mention just a couple of special things that are going on right now that you can be a part of. Uh, first, we are through the month of May doing what we're calling a baby shower for the foster care closet that is housed here in our facility. And that is for uh, special uh, needs uh, that you wouldn't necessarily have in the form of hand-me-downs uh, like clothing and shoes, but things that you might not have just lying around the house such as diapers and wipes and uh, sippy cups, bottles, uh, new socks and children's underwear, things like that. We would love for you to purchase as many of those as you can, be bringing those through the month of May, and we'll be passing those on to the team that leads that foster care ministry uh, all, all across Evergreen and, and beyond, all throughout our county, uh, we uh, are able to be a part of touching lives in very special, uh, sometimes very, very difficult situations. And of course, as we think of, of Mother's Day and the blessing of family, uh, we need to be even more intentional in reaching out to the families all across our community. Another way we're able to do that is through the children's home, the Alabama Baptist Children's Home, which has such a very personal, historical connection with our church family. Uh, you will find uh, those light blue envelopes on the tables in the foyer areas. And I would encourage you to take one of those envelopes and through the, uh, the month of May or June, thinking about Mother's Day and Father's Day, I would encourage you to be planning to give a special children's home offering as well. And of course, that is a part of our annual budget, and we are giving to that every week. When you give uh, your tithes and offerings, uh, part of that goes to the Alabama Baptist Children's Home as well, caring for children. Uh, that, uh, that don't necessarily have the family right now or, or perhaps for the rest of their life uh, like you and I are able to enjoy and even celebrate today. So we want, again, be able to, uh, to touch those lives in a special way. And we can do uh, that in so many ways, but these offerings uh, are, are one of those ways. So thank you so much for being a part of that. And for the events that are coming up, uh, just a quick reminder, our youth camp will be coming up in just a few weeks, so you be praying for them as they prepare for that. And then in a couple of months, as we get into the month of July, our Vacation Bible School, we need you to be signing up now. If you have not already committed to a place of service for our Vacation Bible School, we need you to do that. We need to get that uh, roster set so we can get you the material, so you can be getting together with your teammates for whatever area, classroom, or rotation you will be working. It's going to be an exciting time as we talk about this year in our Vacation Bible School, not being conformed to the world, uh, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind, being building our lives on the solid rock of Jesus. And, uh, and, and that's, that, that's the foundation we need to be sharing with our kids. And I want uh, you to be a part of that. And we need you. We need your hands. We need your feet. We need your smiles. Uh, we need the hugs that you can give. 
uh, that these children who will be coming uh, will need. So you be looking forward to that. And other things coming up as well, you stay connected and plugged in and, and uh, informed. Uh, and if you don't know or not sure, you ask questions, all right? Well, let's pray and thank God for this beautiful day and especially the joy and the gift that we have uh, in, in our mothers today as we celebrate. And then we want to sing, we want to open God's Word, and we want to draw near to Him and ultimately respond to His invitation uh, to go and to serve the Lord with gladness. Father, I thank You today for the very special joy of gathering here, the privilege of, of worship. And I thank You that as we gather here, uh, we know that the promise of your word is true, that where even two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst. Because if that were not the case today, uh, this time uh, would really uh, have no value. But because you are here, because of the, uh, the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit here in this place, oh, this is holy ground. And this is a place where we, and a time where we want to honor and glorify you, Father, and lift up the name of Jesus and celebrate the life and the hope and the salvation that came to us so long ago, but yet is still effective today through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And also, Father, because this day is so special as we celebrate here where we are, Mother's Day, uh, I pray that it would be uh, a day of even more joy and celebration as we are, are thankful as we express that thanks, as we, as we celebrate uh, the many memories uh, of our mothers and our grandmothers and those who have left a legacy of faith and, and service and sacrifice for us. And I pray that as we celebrate that today, we would express that to them, if at all possible, in every way possible, but also that we would pass that faith and that courage and that sacrifice along to our children and to those who come behind us. Father, I thank you that as we worship together today, uh, it is not because of who we are, not because of where we are, not because of what we have or what we can do, that this time is so good. But it is because you are here. It is because you are worthy. It is because you are our hope. and You are our strength. And because... Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I thank you. I thank you for that today. And we celebrate the life and the love that we have through Jesus Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, as we worship together on this beautiful Lord's Day and as we celebrate Mother's Day, we want to give thanks to our Heavenly Father for the perfect love we have from him that he has so often given us through our mothers. We want to worship the Lord today. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Let's sing it together. Joyful, joyful.
worship together, we are reminded so often of the call uh, that we have, the commission that we have from our Lord Jesus Christ to serve together. And I pray that as we do that from day to day, as the hymn writer says, we will serve the Lord with gladness. I want us to sing that together this morning. And then that beautiful prayer, let's sing at the end of that hymn, Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. Serve the Lord with gladness in our works and ways. Come before His presence with our songs of praise. Unto Him, our Maker, we would pledge anew. Let supreme devotion and service true.
Well, let's open God's Word together now. I would invite you to take your Bible along with me and turn to the Old Testament book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 2 is where we will be spending a little bit of time this morning focusing on the gift of a mother's love. The gift of a mother's love. As I've thought of the Mothers that we so often highlight in the Bible when we come to a time like this and the mothers that have made the greatest impact on my life, especially my own mom, uh, my mother-in-law, my wife, uh, who is the mother of our three children. I cannot help today, I cannot help but celebrate so many characteristics that I have seen, that I have experienced, that I have observed in these and so many others that are, without a doubt, worth imitating. Uh, I, think of, I think of the love that I have been given over the years that seems to, to never end. Uh, I, I, think of, I think of patience uh, that uh, from time to time I have no doubt pushed to the limit. Uh, I think of faith that has consistently pointed me to Jesus. I think of sacrifice that cannot be physically measured. Uh, I think of determination and uh, endurance in spite of many, many hurdles along the way. I think of joy that would shine so brightly even in the darkest days. I think of encouragement that came even when I did not do my best. I think of peace in the midst of days that seem to be consumed with uncertainty. And the list, the list could go on and on and on. I would encourage you to sit down perhaps today or in the days ahead and and maybe add to that list of thanksgiving between now and and the second Sunday in June when we think of Father's Day and, and think of so much that we have been given from our godly mothers and fathers. And there are many biblical examples that we could focus on today to to see the exact same kind of love. But I want us to focus on just one today. You will no doubt say amen to that. And that example is in Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, not really one of the more famous moms in the Bible. In fact, you only find her name just a couple of times. And actually, you don't find it here in the text we will read this morning. We're talking about the mother of Moses. Her name was Jochebed. So we're going to read the first 10 verses and then talk a little bit more about the one whose name means Jehovah is her glory. All right. Verse 1 of Exodus chapter 2. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, She hid him for three months. We'll talk a little bit more about the why behind that in just a moment. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. And she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him. And she said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister who had been hiding in the reeds, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. Jochebed, 
We don't even hear her name until Exodus chapter 6. One more time in Numbers chapter 26, verse 59, we also hear her name. But you think about this for a moment. The mother of Moses, the mother perhaps we might could describe, the mother of the child who in the Old Testament gives us maybe the most, who lives a life most descriptive of what Jesus will ultimately do in the New Testament and even his own crucifixion as if we, we, as we have recently celebrated his crucifixion and resurrection was celebrated on the Passover which God instituted through the life and ministry of Moses yet his mother, the mother of Moses only named twice in the scripture, now you go over to Hebrews chapter 11, and there is a generic, uh, anonymous, if you will, uh, reference to the parents of Moses in that roll call of faith. But it's, it just says his parents. Her name is only mentioned twice. But her name is Jochebed, and as I mentioned a moment ago, it means Jehovah is her glory. Her husband's name kind of a manly sort of name. Amram was his name. Now, that's a, that's a manly name if there ever was one. And she already had two children. We meet the daughter, the older daughter in this text. Again, her name is not mentioned here, but her name was Miriam. We, we of course, meet her later on in the days of the Exodus. Miriam was the oldest, but he also had a brother who was three years older, and his name was Aaron. Now, we know the age difference because we read that in Exodus chapter 7, verse 7. It is spoken of there that there was three years, he was three years older than Moses. So Moses is the baby, then Aaron, then Miriam. Beautiful family. But when we begin this passage here about the birth of Moses, something very unusual jumps out at us. We begin reading about the birth of Moses if we just pull chapter 2. If this is all you have, then this might be rather confusing. Because to understand why the circumstances begin to unfold so very mysteriously in chapter 2, we have to know what's going on in chapter 1. Why does what we read in chapter 2? Why did she have to hide him? Why did she put him in the basket and float him down the river as he got older? Well, we have to go back to chapter 1, and let's do that very briefly. You are quite possibly familiar with the story, but just in case, let me refresh your memory. In chapter 1, verse 6, we read that Joseph and all his generation have died. The generation of Joseph and the sons of Jacob have died. Now, that might not seem necessarily overwhelmingly significant until... We read what happens in the next two verses. Verse 7, the narration also informs us that the people of Israel were greatly increasing in number. Again, not necessarily an unusual thing. The Israelite nation was growing, multiplying exponentially, perhaps. But then when we get to verse 8, we read that a new king, a new pharaoh arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now, basically, what we could insert perhaps in parentheses there when it says he did not know Joseph, he, he had no respect for Joseph as the previous king did because of all that Joseph had done literally to save Egypt. This new king did not know Joseph. He did not honor. He did not respect what Joseph had done and therefore honor his people. And out of fear, because of the growth of the Israelite nation. So it's significant that we read that narration there because you go on down beginning in verse 9 and following to the end of the chapter, this new king forces, first of all, the Israelite people into slavery. He places taskmasters over them. And as he begins to build his kingdom, they are his labor. And then... To prevent a greater potential uprising from an Israelite army, what does he do? He implements a birth control plan which consisted of killing all the newborn baby boys. It's as simple as that. It's as harsh and as graphic as that. To prevent a new generation of strong men rising up in the ranks of Israel, he creates birth control program 
where all of the baby boys that were born were to be killed. Literally commanding the Hebrew midwives, when a baby boy was born, kill it. And if you keep reading there toward the end of chapter 1, you find that they refused. They refused, and because of that, God blessed them even more. And at least one mom we read here now in chapter 2 took matters into her own hands to protect her son. Her name was Jochebed. Now, uh, it may seem old-fashioned and somewhat plain this morning, but I would like to honor our mothers today for doing what I believe the Bible says God created them to do. Simple as that. Simple as that. And we see this in the life of the mother of Moses, Jochebed. What did she do? What do we see here that I believe we should honor today and strive to continue as moms, and yes, I will say, as you have heard me say before on days like this today, dads, don't turn me off. This is for all of us. Specifically, yes, we honor our mothers today. But the family is a mother and a father, the fullest, the most complete family, yes. And I realize as we look around us today in our communities and in our culture, that is not always the case. And that is where I must say the church should even step in more intentionally. But what did she do? What did she do that we should honor today, that we should strive to emulate today? First of all, she protected him. She protected him just as we should protect our children today. We see that in the first few verses that we read in chapter 2 where he was born. And knowing what would happen if she had a son, they didn't have ultrasound. They They didn't do a gender reveal party like we might do today. She just had to wait and wonder. I can't even begin to imagine the whirlpool of emotions that she experienced as that day grew closer. Not knowing, would it be a girl? Would it be a boy? She had one of each. It was the toss of a coin. It was a 50-50 chance. Think of all the things that we do leading up to a baby's birth. Oh, we have baby showers. We get the nursery all ready and decorated. Now we have some of the most amazing and and forgive me if this sounds offensive but i've seen some some videos of the most outlandish gender reveal settings uh, that i could i could have not even fought up myself and she sat instead at home wondering perhaps speaking with other moms to be that were her neighbors and her friends what are we going to do You say, well, the only worry would have been if it was a boy, right? Well, no. No, because think about it. Think about it. Imagine today. Let's put it in context today. It didn't matter if it was a boy or a girl. Listen, they were living in slavery to the Egyptians. So let's put it in context today. Imagine that today every pregnant woman was tagged according to her political or religious affiliation. Now stop there and let that sink in for just a moment. Because there are countries where that is done. Think of this morning. If a pregnant woman is tagged according to her political or religious affiliation. And when she gives birth to a baby, the child is immediately either taken away and murdered. Or commissioned into lifelong slavery. That's what she had to look forward to. That's what she was waiting for. Can you imagine? That's what was happening. So what did she do? She delivered her child. It was a son. And I believe she had already committed to doing whatever it took if it was going to be a boy to save his life. So she hid him for three months. But after that, she was no longer able to hide him. We don't know why. Perhaps his cry became too loud. Perhaps the, the, the searches uh, for, 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 for newborns was becoming more intense. We don't know. It doesn't say. But eventually she had to try and save him a different way. So what did she do? Well, she placed him in the Nile River. Often we read in a basket, except in the King James. And if you read the King James, it says something that sounds a bit confusing. Why would would in the King James it say in an ark? Why would it say an ark? That's what Noah built, right? Way back in Genesis chapter 6. 
But the same word is used, in fact, if, if I remember correctly, the 28 times that this word is used, 26 of those times in every translation but the King James, it is used in Genesis 6 through 9. Two times it is used here, and it's called a basket. But it's the, it's the Hebrew word tabal. That doesn't mean a whole lot, but it's the same word that was used when God told Noah to build an ark. The word literally means a chest or a box. Now, as I think about that, as, as fabulous and, and, and beautiful as, as our visit to Kentucky was not too long ago to see the ark, I'm not sure that I can say, and this is not something that you know, we have to fuss about, but I'm not sure that the shape was as, as necessarily as round and, and flowing and aerodynamic. The word literally just means a chest or a box. So it's very possible that, that even the ark that Noah floated around in for so long just looked like a ginormous box. That's what it was. Now, that's irrelevant today, but I want you to understand the same thing because here's the beauty of that picture. Can you imagine that as Jochebed and, and Miriam and, and Aaron worked on that little ark they thought about Noah same word and perhaps maybe even did they pray to Jehovah God and perhaps as she put him in there on that dreaded day and placed him down in the waters of the Nile River maybe did she pray God would you protect my son just as you protected Noah and his family in the ark I don't know but I have to wonder I must wonder well what happened next was obviously the proof of God's providence even in the midst of impossible circumstances Miriam is assigned the task of walking down the edge of the river in the tall reeds keeping an eye as long as she could, as far as she possibly could, to report back to her mother what happens. Moses, big sister. Oh, we couldn't make it without big sisters, could we? No, we couldn't. She watched that little ark float down the river, and, it, and of all places, it floated right up to the back porch of the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh. And she just so happens, no, she didn't just so happen. It was God's timing. She was coming down to bathe in the Nile. And as she comes down into the Nile and her maidens are there, she sees this homemade basket floating down the river. And oh, what a mysterious thing this is. And she commanded that it be brought to her. And she opens the lid. And what does she see and hear but a, a little crying baby boy? Perhaps because of his skin color. Perhaps because of the cloth in which he was wrapped. She immediately knew this is the child of one of the Hebrew slaves. But oh, instead of being filled with the, with the jealousy and suspicion that her father was filled with, she was filled with the compassion and pity of a mother. And she loved him. And Miriam could see it. She could see it in her eyes. Oh, perhaps she was already trying to console the baby there in that little ark. And Miriam knew it was time to act. So she splashed out. And perhaps she had done this before. We don't know. Because she seemed to not feel threatened by, by splashing out into the place there where the princess came. Maybe she had done that before. Maybe not. Maybe it was just God's leading in this little girl's heart to say, now's the moment. Go. And she went. And she went. Don't tell me that God can't speak to the heart of a child and lead them exactly into the place where they need to be and she jumped out of the reeds knowing that this high-class princess had no desire to change Hebrew diapers <laughs> so what did she do she ran and said oh oh your majesty your highness would you like for me to go call one of the Hebrew women to be this little baby's nanny and maybe she thought Oh, now that's a good idea. Yes, go little girl, go little one. 
And bring me someone who can care for this little boy until he is weaned. Until he's at least old enough to feed himself, you know. So where does she go? Where does she go? She goes and finds his mother. She goes and gets his mother. Listen, think about it. Think about it. The same God who parted the Red Sea before Moses guided the currents of the Nile River and floated that little basket right to where it needed to be. Same God. Same God. And perhaps, perhaps the psalmist Asaph was thinking about the same mighty hand of our God. When he wrote Psalm 77 in verse 16, he said, When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. And Jesus, God in the flesh, even proved God's power over all creation when he told the waves to be still. The same God, the same God guided the gentle currents of that Nile River, placing that basket exactly where it needed to be. And where did it all begin? It began in the heart of a, of a mother who desired to protect her child. Oh, do we do the same today? Do we have that same desire? Whatever the cost, oh, she could have gotten into big trouble. She could have gotten into big trouble. Because no doubt it wouldn't have taken long to find out if she had instigated a search. If the princess had instigated a search, it would not have taken long to find out. And probably made, could have made a very short list of women who had just had a baby. Wouldn't have been hard. But she protected him. But then what did she have the opportunity to do? Oh, now not only did she have the opportunity as she had birthed him to protect him, but now she had the opportunity to nurture him. And that's exactly what she did. She nurtured him. As we've already mentioned, the princess had no desire to change Hebrew diapers. So she called for a, a, a nanny to be found, and Miriam goes and gets her mother. Wow. Talk about the providence of God. Talk about God's timing in an impossible situation. Listen, Jochebed had trusted her son into God's care. Even before he was born, perhaps as you had done for your own children, even before they were born, praying for them, trusting them into God's care. But all oh, the prayers no doubt flooded with tears as she laid that basket into the Nile River, praying, God, please, please protect my son. Just as the ark protected Noah and his family, would you surround this ark, Jehovah God? And it did. And just as she had trusted her son into God's care, now she would have the blessing of nurturing him, teaching him. Think about this. She had already given her son away to God, but now she would have the opportunity to teach him to walk, teach him to talk. And even instilling in him the foundation of his Hebrew heritage. Yes, oh, I dare say she did. She may have had Egyptian alphabet lesson books that she was ordered to teach, but I dare say she taught him his Hebrew heritage. Why do you say that? Because, oh, we see as a young adult... The love for his people that rose up within him when he saw their mistreatment, when he saw their oppression, even to the point of killing an Egyptian taskmaster. Oh, yes. Where did that come from? That came from his mother. That came from her as she nurtured him. Wow. Again, we must think about where we are today and the responsibility that we have today as mothers and fathers to our children in a society and a world that is becoming more and more like the Egypt and the Babylon of Old Testament days. How can we thrive? How can we live obediently as followers of Christ? We must be building on the right foundation. We must stop building on the foundations of Babylon. We must stop building in our world today on the foundations of Egypt. And we must start building on the foundation of God's holy word. The solid rock on which we stand. God's foundation. I love the very personal nature 
of Paul's letter to Timothy, writing to him like Timothy was his own son. And in a way, spiritually speaking, he was. But listen to how Paul echoes this truth in the second letter that we have that Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Paul writes, you, however, continue in the things you have learned. He's talking about his foundation. In the things you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them. And from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Where did that come from? Well, you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5 and who does Paul praise? He praises his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. The foundation that they laid for their son, Timothy, Paul, now saying, hey, you, you, your foundation is good. Build on the good foundation. And that is what it looks like when we nurture our children. And the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Oh, oh, may we, may we stop, may we strive to not take the easy way and build on the foundations of Babylon and Egypt, but instead build on the solid rock of God's Word. That is how we must nurture our children today. But then she did one more thing. Actually, really, you could say she did for the second time. Something that she had to do twice. <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't imagine having to do this twice, but for a second time. Finally, she released him. She released him. We read it there in verse 10. The child grew. Oh, I believe there's so much wrapped up in that word, grew. He grew in every way. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And I know Jochebed would, would not have read these words. But when I read them, I have to imagine the emotion that overwhelmed her heart and her mind when he became her son. No longer, no longer the son of a, officially, legally, the son of a Hebrew slave, but now the, the son of the princess. Wow. She released him. Did she do this because she didn't love him or because she feared the wrath of the government if she didn't comply? No, I don't think so. I think she was able to do it because she knew she was convinced. She had seen it again and again. She knew that Jehovah God was in control. She knew it. <laughs> she, had, she, had stories that, she had stories that she couldn't even tell so as not to put her own family and the, and the life of Moses in danger. She, she had so many stories, but she couldn't tell them. She couldn't tell them. But oh, I believe perhaps like Mary, the mother of Jesus, she treasured them in her heart. I believe she did. And she released him. God had saved her son. He had given her the opportunity to nurture him in some of his most teachable years. And now she knew that God would use him in ways that no one could ever imagine. Dare say in those days she had wept with other mothers whose sons had been thrown into the Nile. She knew, she knew the gift that she had been given, and she released him. She demonstrated here a faith that I'm not sure any of us can understand. Oh, what a faith. Although she couldn't see where God was leading the first time or the second time, she was willing to trust that this way, his way was best and that he could take care of her son even better than she could. And yes, there comes the time in the life of every parent. And it's not easy. But we must confess the same. God, I know. I know that you can take care of my child even better than I can. Oh, she was living out words that had not even been written 
by Solomon himself. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. These words had not even been written, but yet the one whose name was Jehovah is my glory was living them out. Wow. Let me close with something wonderful. Want to know something wonderful? You don't have to be a mom or a dad to give that kind of love. We've actually been talking about it for a while lately. You see, this is a love that we will give. This is a love that we will naturally, instinctively, intentionally give when we are living out, here it comes, the great commandment and the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. Completely loving God, compassionately loving others, courageously taking the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation across the street and around the world. That's the mission. And it's not just for moms, it's not just for dads. It's for each and every one of us. It's not just for adults. It's even for the children. Even for a little girl who walks along the side of the river looking for someone to help. Looking how she can serve. Oh, it's for all of us. And here's the truth. When we've received, when you have received the perfect love of our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, then the best thing that you can do is to give it away. Give it away. Especially those around you. Especially those closest to you at home, at school, at work. Those that you meet along the way who are desperately looking for this eternal love and all of the temporary things that this world has to offer. Oh, and we know the way. We know the truth. We know the life. His name is Jesus. Hmm. Well, what happened to Jochebed? We don't know. We don't know. I've already said she's only mentioned a couple of times, which just blows my mind. The mother of Moses, someone who should perhaps have been the most recognized mother in the Old Testament. She's just mentioned a couple of times. Psst, that's it. But all we do know, we do know that her faith and her courage lived on in her children and her children's children. So I would offer this prayer today. May we, may we all live in such a way where Jehovah is glorified not only to our children but through our children and our children's children and their children until Jesus Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the, the beautiful, powerful story of a woman who is just sparsely mentioned in the pages of Scripture, yet was willing to sacrifice it all to save her son for your glory. And Father, I thank you today that That that's the same kind of love in a perfect fashion that, that you have demonstrated to us. Sending, giving, sacrificing your best, your only begotten son, for us. Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I pray today that we would know that love. We would receive that love. We would trust that that perfect sacrifice through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus is enough to save, and to heal, and to transform our lives into and it's worth trusting our all, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And I pray today, especially for the one here, or perhaps the one listening, 
or watching online who has not come to that place of trust and surrender and obedience to you through Jesus Christ. And today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day to say yes to Jesus. Is that you right here, right now, today? Perhaps you realize you need to come to Jesus and say, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, I believe that's who you are. I believe that's why you came and lived and died, were buried and rose again. And today, I turn from my sin in repentance and faith to you, Jesus, as my Savior. And today, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I trust you with my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength, my all. And today, I follow you. Oh, those are the first steps of faith that you must take before you are able to walk with Jesus, before you are able to know his love, and before you are able to give that love that the world around you and me is so desperately seeking. It may be today that you realize you are trusting Jesus, but you are not living in step with him, and you are not giving that hope and that life and that love that he has so richly given to you. You're not giving that at home and at school or at work or along the way. And, and you know today that needs to be the mission and the message of your life. And you would surrender to that today, whatever the cost. Father, I thank you. Again, as we celebrate the joy of, and the blessing of our mothers and the great selfless sacrificial love that we have been given, but I thank you that the greatest love of all is the love you have given through Jesus Christ and today we we surrender our all to you we go from this place celebrating and asking that you would use us for your glory Lord just just as the name we have learned today means Jehovah is glory so would that be the same for us I pray in Jesus name amen